I'm very wary of sticking to a, a very rigid plan and schedule because for me sometimes it ruins it. I'm, you know, if we're kind of rushing to get somewhere for a certain time, it takes away the enjoyment and the spontaneity of, of rocking up somewhere just off the cuff and yeah. If you like some way, you can you can spend a few more nights there than perhaps you originally had planned, and and that was very much the kind of tone that we set for the whole trip. And when we eventually did get into Spain, we didn't plan on staying anywhere longer than a few days, roughly speaking. But we found an area that we really loved, and and that was the the Costa Blanca. And I mean, it was just at the back of kind of Benidorm, Denier, Calpe region, so not too far inland. Yeah. But the, the trail running scene there was incredible. I mean, I don't think half the races that we did there would have taken place in the UK because we shut them down straight away. Yeah. But I loved it. And, you know, we turned up at the first race that we did there. And at the end of it, I was just like, my knees were covered in blood. I'd fallen over. I'd like, it, it was like pretty epic. And I don't even, I think it was like a 12 mile race, but I felt like a marathon, you know, like on, yeah. on the mountains. And it was just really exciting. And from then on in, I thought, right, this is the place for us. We're going to spend some serious time here. Yeah. And we loved it. And we, we got, you know, involved in the community. We've got, we've got a great group of friends. I even joined, both of us even joined, like, a, a local Spanish running club, uh, Bernia, which was uh, my favourite ridge um, where we were staying. So this really epic kind of, um, like, dangerous um, kind of, running slash climbing you know like uh, the sort of thing you'd have to approach with a, with a, a helmet on you know that sort of thing and it, it, it for me that area was really special so naturally I wanted to kind of be involved with the local club there and I did quite a few races for that club and I'll go back and you know I could eventually live somewhere like that mature, but we really enjoyed our time there and it it was a special moment in my life if I'm honest. What was the, ter the terrain in so like the Spanish, French, and Italian races? Is that all similar to each other and ju just totally different to the fell running scene where it's um, out yeah. and out, fog and yes. hills and slippy and yeah, it's totally. I mean, it's totally different to the fell running scene because it's dry for a start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the so the footwear I was wearing was totally different. But then again, it, it is different from location to location. So. The stuff in the Costa Blanca, for example, is very dry and I would, I would say anger is a good word. Anything you land on <laughs> in the Costa Blanca is like wants to hurt you. As in like, obviously you're going to hurt yourself falling over, but you know, the, the kind of um, flora and fauna is all prickly and spiky and aggressive. You know, like right. you fall over there and not just the rock, everything wants to attack and hurt you. So you end up loose rocks or just... just yeah, it's it's a bit of both really. So it's 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 hard packed ground, but then you've got loose rock as well, and you know some of it's limestone, like we might have in the Yorkshire Dales, but it's not slippy because it's usually quite dry. Yeah. So you want something with a lot of cushioning, really, like um, uh, a Terra Innovate Terra Ultra or like a Hoka Torrent, that kind of shoe. Or mm -hmm. Scott was quite good. I tried a few different shoes to be honest, um, and the Terra Ultra was quite good because it gave me a lot of cushioning and. That kind of ground just takes a lot of energy from you because you're running on the hard rock all the time. Yeah. But steps as well, you know, I, I was like dreaming of steps and I was falling asleep on the night because it's just... Well, my made steps, so, so I, natural steps. A bit of both, really. Like um, natural steps, but also man-made ones as well, um, where you're going down into big ravines. So, that, again, that was mostly um, kind of man-made. Um, where you come through a really... A natural landscape but you can you know you've got the amazing backdrops but then also you're running on something that's been created by a man and yeah. um, and it was just yeah it was quite aggressive terrain so I, I, I felt you know after racing out there and training out there every day my body was in bits quite often I know you you mentioned previously about like how did you cope with running every day and like what were you like I struggled a bit but I was resting a lot as well I was I was literally sleeping like 12 hours a night because I felt like I needed it. I was doing like 100 mile weeks you now out there over serious stuff. I mean, I'd done, I think, 300,000 foot of climbing from January to March um, last year, which is an incredible amount, really, when you think about it. I was on course for doing a ridiculous amount of climb over the year had it not been for COVID. So yeah. within three, I was doing 100,000 foot um, a month, at least 25,000 foot a week minimum, um, easily as well. Um, but that does take its toll on your body. And when you, you approach your 40 years old, 
and you've been running you know over 20 years it, naturally you're going to feel aches and pains so i was conscious that i needed to rest and i spent most of my time either running or sleeping or eating uh, <laughs> and then a bit of working in the van so I, I found a really nice balance of kind of rest recovery but running hard as well and i felt really fit it was great and but when i came you, back to the uk and it was totally different <laughs> when you start to feel so like aches and pains do you have specific like do you, do your knees feel it your hips or your back or what do you feel yeah it's in my legs usually so because i think i enjoy descending so much and climbing so much a lot of the, the my weight goes through my knees when i'm descending my, right. my legs so I, I often have sore knees um also my ankle joints as well take a lot of impact yes. in the turning the stabilizing you know when you're on rough ground so in the morning i'd wake up and i'd kind of hobble around for it took me about an hour to warm up you know i could hear things clicking and moving i said one thing i did try actually was um started taking some cbd oil which i felt okay. helped actually yeah. um I'm, I'm never into this kind of kind of thing but somebody told me about it and i felt like it helped me sleep, first of all but then also like loosen up everything up as well and i felt less aches and pains and i don't know if it was placebo effect or not whether it was doing any good i don't know but i certainly felt like it was but uh, the the root of all that and the main thing was getting just rest and recovery you know so sleeping a lot but not doing anything in between tough runs and eating really well and hydrating they were the most important things obviously i mean the other stuff is is having some impact but perhaps not as much as that um and i'd take things like cod liver oil and i stopped drinking it while i was out there i know i mentioned the gin and tonic story but yeah. for a few months in, in spain i didn't i didn't drink because i thought you'd be on the sangrias in the afternoon yeah i was tempted i don't get me wrong the temptation was absolutely there i just replaced it with coffee and, uh, and food um but yeah i think the thing with me is i, I do enjoy a drink but it doesn't really oh, agree no. with me and i'd never i didn't want to waste that opportunity either you know i'd gone out there to compete and train and i took it quite seriously so i was eating really well and drinking like the right kind of thing and not not you know not just having a bit because i could i could have got drunk in beer and like got on the beard you know because it's pretty cheap out there yeah that's not why you're there, is it? That's not why I'm there, because I, I, just, I just didn't fancy it. So it's not that I don't drink, it's just that I was not to, because the, the running for me was more important. And, you know, I wanted the quality of sleep, the quality of training, and I wanted, to, I wanted to go out there and race and really make an impression. And actually, the first race that I did out there in Spain, I was beaten by a good friend of mine now called Paul, um, who is a Salomon-sponsored runner. He lives in, in Spain. He lives uh, near Montserrat fantastic fantastic runner and he beat me by about i think six minutes in the first race that we, we did together um and I, i'd led it for most of the way and then he just came through and he was really strong and i just kept training uh, and training and working hard and racing every weekend and by the end i think i beat him by about 10 minutes in the last race that we did together so it kind of showed the journey that i'd been on and how much effort i put and work i put into you know, making myself a better athlete and um, i mean I have to say that he had been injured during that time as well, so that didn't help uh, him either. But it did make me more focused because I had that competition there and, you know, we became really competitive, but really good friends as well uh, yeah, at the same time. We pushed it, we pushed each other. Um, and, and that gave me a lot of focus, you know, so I have, I have him to thank for kind of making me into yeah, a better athlete. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think he probably felt the same as well. So I think... You know, when he's fully fit and I'm fully fit, we're very, very similar athletes. I think it could go either way. Mm -hmm. But um, because I was there to train and race and he was still working and he was recovering from injury, at the end, I was, I was beating him, whereas he was beating me at the beginning. But that was, that was the main reason. I was just in a better position to be able to train and recover and rest and also compete for those races. Do you think the racing that you were doing there and the, the extra fitness that you were gaining would have benefited when you came home and done races in the UK, or is it just totally different? No, well, I think the answer to your question is yes and no. So there's no doubt that I was in really good fitness and form. Uh, and when I came back, um, I came back just before COVID. So we actually came back to do a race, which was the first British Championship race. And I'd been winning races out in Spain quite comfortably. And when I came back, I was ninth in the first race in the British Championship on a, a course that suited me. Um, and the distance that suited me. But I think that just shows the quality and standard that we've got in the UK, if I'm honest. Um, 
because you know it wasn't that I had a bad race when I came back into Wales. Um, I was a little bit tired from all the travelling we'd done to get to the race, and that didn't help. But I'm not using that as an excuse. I don't think it could have run much faster or much better if I'd been fully rested for it. And you know, and uh, I, we were we were racing to get back because we booked the ferry. Um, so we'd done a lot of like long days travelling, and I'd not I'd not done any running for about four or five days in the build to race. But again, I'm not using it as an excuse. Um, but it, it was a different kind of running when I got back. So we were coming back from dry, fast, runnable trails in, in nice weather to like horrible weather in North Wales and not great conditions on rough, boggy, energy sapping ground. And I felt, I found that transition hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I was in good shape and I was fit. So I've no excuse. And I was happy with ninth, don't get me wrong. Um, really happy. But as I said, I think it shows the quality and standard that we've got in this country. It is a different type of running. It really is. And I think had the British champ been on that terrain I was used to over the last six months prior to that, I would probably fared a little bit better. I'm not saying I would have won by any stretch, but I was used to I was used to running on that terrain. Yeah. The answer to your question is yes and no, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes it sense. is very different. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good question because, you know, if you've got the fitness there, I'm a strong believer that you can you can race well on any kind of terrain. If you're if you're in good condition. And I was in good condition. So I think ninth was a fair result for me. I think the, the, the best result I could have expected was perhaps to be top five. I, I don't think I'd have won it, but um, I was happy with that. And I was happy with the transition I've made from those nice, runnable, aggressive trails, really technical, kind of sloppy, um, horrible weather, you know, like classic bell running, where you're just like, oh, this is, you're back, back to it now. Welcome to England, you know, or welcome to yeah. Wales. You touched, on, you touched on earlier, you mentioned the word VK. So have you done many VKs? Yeah, so VKs is something that I've I've experienced. I've not done many. I think I've done maybe three or four um, of the last so few years. VK, that's what, a thousand uh, metres yeah. ascent within 5K, isn't it? That's exactly what it is, yeah. So to have a VK, it's a thousand metres of ascent within, I think it's five, five kilometres of distance. Um, now, Naturally, we're not going to have any in England because we haven't got anything that's over a thousand metres for a start. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we do have VK races in Scotland uh, and in Wales, although some of them have got a little bit of down. I think the one in, in Wales is in Snowdon, um, yeah. on Snowdon. And there's a tiny section of downhill, but generally speaking, you're going up a thousand metres. And I think it's over 5k, so it is a VK, but it isn't. Okay, Just the rules. Good. Yeah, but there is a VK at the. the um, yeah, series okay. that we the Salomon uh, Golden Trail series. Um, and it's just about the only place you could do a VK in the UK is it is in uh, Scotland. But a VK race is something that you have to train for, for the class. So if you're going to take it seriously, you have to be training to do that kind of racing because when you're going up and you are literally just going up for a thousand metres, yeah. you've got to have that endurance and that strength. Um, and, and that kind of muscle memory, I'd say, that training to be able to allow you to, to attack that kind of race at pace yeah. it's not something you can just turn up for and and like do really well at. i think you've got to be um used to climbing that did that you know that that mountain descent first of all that intensity of, of a race because it's a bit like boffra you, you're literally going at hammer and tong from the start yeah, yeah. it's not they're not nice races you don't enjoy doing them you do at the end because you sort of like got a beautiful view at the top of the you know the climb yeah. Um, there's actually a race in Italy that's a triple VK, so you're just literally climbing for 3,000 meters straight up, and it just sounds savage because you've not only got the climb, but you've also then got the altitude to contend with as yeah. well. Um, yeah. But it's difficult because when I've done the VK, I've always been all right up until about I'd say 700 meters, which is the, probably the, the biggest distance, the biggest climb you'd get in this country, you know, in a, in a race. And after that, the last 300, I have just died of death because it's taking you into a place that you're not quite used to. Your body's not used to it, unless you're training on that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's very specific, you know, to a, a kind of mountainous environment like the Alps or the Pyrenees or places like that where you can get a thousand metres in. But it's just a different kind of rating. It really is. They're really exciting, though. It's something I want to do more of, actually, um, you know, going into the future. I've, I've, I've done one VK and I was fine for about 100 metres, <laughs> 900 metres of absolutely dying. 
yeah. I mean, what I actually would like to see is a vertical VK, like, sorry, not vertical, a downhill VK, where you're actually <laughs> losing a thousand metres high. I'm yeah. sure there's one out there, and people watching this probably might know of one. If there is, please get in touch, because that sounds like my dream of a race. Yeah, well, it'd be good if there was a VK that up and down, as opposed to well, just up or just down. You, you just took the words out of my mouth there, because I was thinking that one that I did in France, where I was sixth, when I got to the top, I was obviously knackered, but I thought if I was going back down now yeah. on that kind of terrain, because it You'd was really it. gnarly stuff, I thought I could really like make a difference going down. And I think that's where I would excel as an athlete, because that would play to my strengths. There were some steep drops, you know, there were some really dangerous sections of that race. Because a lot of it is roped as well in certain places. You might be going on really kind of technical beer for kind of routes where you are quite exposed. So you need that confidence, not just on the terrain, but also um if you if you've got an overhang for example like being able to do something like that and sections like that at pace you know it takes a particular mindset you've got to really switch off you can look down and think you know I'm now and i'm gonna have to be careful if i slip i'm gonna injure myself yeah. um, and usually when i do this kind of thing i don't tell my mum that i'm doing it either because my mum goes mad in the head <laughs> <laughs> i did um i did this one in italy which is tre refugia it's a uh, a relay of Three refugees, three refugees. First leg, and it's a, it, it's a up uh, only leg, um, and then the second leg is a via ferrata leg where you're climbing on really exposed stuff. You've got to wear a helmet to race, and uh, and it's very very technical. And I yeah, like to you always go downhill. Are you clipped in at well, all? Or? No, you don't clip in, and that's the thing. So when I've done this race, I've never told my mum that I'm going to go and do it because she'd be really worried because it is like. So you're racing against people who are on the same route and the reason you're wearing a helmet is because you, you, you've got to be really you're safety conscious. You could fall off, you could hit your head, but also you've got people in front of you on the route who are knocking rocks off. Them and down. There has been occasions where I've had rocks like, hit me on the head during that race or I've knocked them off onto somebody else. Um, and that's a really, that's probably the most dangerous race or one of the most dangerous races I've done. But I you love would take kind of people on that sort of when it's... Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, and what you'd have to do is perhaps if you are climbing on a, a dangerous section is pick a route that isn't too dangerous that you can't overtake somebody or wait for a moment where you can pass somebody. Um, right. And it, I suppose it goes back to knowing the course, really. But there are sections on that particular course where you can overtake somebody. Usually, I'm getting overtaken. Because... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I struggle with the altitude on that race because you're starting at 2,000 metres and when you go into a, um, a race like that, because it only lasts for two and a half uh, miles does this race, not even a 5k I don't think, but it's so intense and you are working at such a fierce in intensity, you, you, your lungs are just on fire and you're fighting oxygen, you know, you're know, you trying to get air in all the time, yeah. but at the same time you try not to like die you can fall you know ridge you're trying to you know race as hard as you can and i don't think i've ever been in a race where i've worked to my maximum heart rate like that i mean i don't even wear a heart rate monitor because i'm scared to think what the results oh, are you're just about race. to ask you that how do you do that but obviously not. I, I do normally yeah not for that race though because i think <laughs> yeah, it'd be off the i think my watch would blow up to be honest uh you know i, I can feel what my heart rate is because my head's pounding you know um but that, that is such a, a fierce and intense race that when I get to the end, I'm just literally collapsing over the line. It, I'm, my body's just craving oxygen. I'm just trying to get the air in, you know. Um, but that's an incredible race. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I love doing, you know, going to somewhere uh, in Europe, for example, like Italy, where you've got that kind of amazing uh, scenery, uh, yeah. incredible technical terrain that you wouldn't get in this country. And you're just competing on something that is, you'd look at prior to the race and think, I'm going to go up there. And it is pretty stunning, you know. And you get, Do you get many supporters when you're on the route? Or is it yeah. that remote that you can't? No, you, because it's mountain running in Italy, um, especially in Italy, and other parts of Europe as well. It is a really well-respected and well-loved sport. So you, wherever there's going to be a big prestigious race, you're going to have support and people will make the effort to get to places to to watch it and it sometimes it feels like a bit like Tour de France where you might be running along and you've got people either side of you just going nuts you know shouting in your face and screaming um, and it's amazing the atmosphere is amazing they've got cowbells and the ringing and the shouting in your ears and you've always got support on a race like that in the most bizarre 
sections. I mean, there's sections where it's quite long and you don't, but, but usually you've got that stunning backdrop and because you're racing on such a, an incredible horse, people want to see you on that going fast and, you know, it's, there's risk involved and people like that drama and it's, it's amazing. That, that's what, for me, that's the best part of the, the race, you know, like the, the, the support that you get, the buzz. And, and most of the crowd are, are well researched and read up on like who's racing as well. They'll know who you are. You know, if you're coming from another country to in their local race, they will know exactly who you are most, for the most part. And generally speaking, they're very supportive. Um, apart from the first time I went to Italy and I was competing and uh, I was at Trophy of Anoni, actually. It was the first time I went to Trophy of Anoni and I was in second place, I think, and I had the local champion, Alex Baldacini, rating behind me. He's got the record for that, the whole race. And I, I was conscious of the fact that as I was going up the last part of the climb, all the Italians were screaming, die, die, die. And I'm telling you, die, die, die. I'm thinking, geez, like, die, like, this is, this is awful. Like, why would they want me to die? You know, like, it's, this is, and this was like pre, you know, pre Brexit as well, like, before we, Brexit didn't even be mentioned. Um, and uh, afterwards, I realized that, like, die, die, die just means, like, go, 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 like, go faster, go faster. So it's just like a, a real friendly, uh, you know, kind of mountain term. It's like your alley, alley, alley. Juice. That at the time I was thinking this is a really hot environment and it made me go fast because I thought I don't want to stop they might actually <laughs> you know like stone me to death <laughs> so I'll keep moving fast um, but yeah that was incredible it's when you've got that support and it's just electric you know like you, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I enjoy the most about these races the, the feeling and, and the fact that people love the rating so much as well not only the people running the races but the supporters because I think that's sometimes sometimes something we don't always get in this country. It's a very specialist um, sport. It's like yeah, Fellering, for example. Yeah. Very niche. And the people that love Fellering are generally people that are doing the Fellering. So you don't quite have the support base that you would get in certain parts of Europe. And you don't always have the crowds. Um, and I really like that. I, you know, I like the atmosphere. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I do it. So that's why I enjoy going to Europe so much. Yeah. 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 And what, what's, what's coming up in 2021? Hopefully, anyway. yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I'm not living in the camper van, as you can see, I'm, I'm at home. Uh, you can probably hear the dog barking earlier, like Amazon parcels getting delivered every day. I'm back to normality now. Uh, you know, so it's uh, it's a strange time that we're living in. Um, and I'm back working full time for sports shoes, which, is, which I'm absolutely loving. So mm -hmm. anything I do plan now is going to be working around, you know, my role and with it within the company yeah. um, but I'm lucky in the fact that I'm working in the running industry they support me as an athlete as well and I've got quite a few races coming up um, where I'll be competing for sports shoes so one example the big aim for me this year is the MCT which is the kind of baby race of the UTMB so it's uh, for, I mean for me it's a, it's a, it's a, so which, uh, which one's that again the MC MCT so it's the race actually for the kind of organisers and locals to do Although saying that, standard is still like ridiculously high. I thought, I thought it, the OCC was the smallest one. Is there another one as well? Yeah, this is the this is the baby baby one. Yeah, so <laughs> this is the really like baby one. Um, right. And I thought it the would kids be a good one. Start. Yeah, the kids one. Exactly that. Exactly that. So this is a, was a big a good starting point for me because it's kind of a distance that I think I could be competitive on. Mm -hmm. um, I think off the top of my head, it's about forty kilometers with two and a half thousand meters, which really is the top end of my kind of racing um spectrum really you know my my skill set i'm gonna have to train hard for it that's that's for sure um but it is competitive as well you know when i look at past results the people who've won it before are pretty damn good uh, and i'm going to use it as a stepping stone i think to go yeah. back to what you were asking me before about doing longer races mm -hmm. so as perhaps a way into things like the ott um in future years you know that i want to see how well i do this one first whether i enjoy it as well um but i'll be doing it Primarily for experience, and and I'll be don't get me wrong, I'll be trying to trying to win it. I don't think I can win it, but I will be trying to win it. Um, I'll certainly won't hold back in that respect, and I'll train to win as well. Um, so I've got that on the the radar. I've also got the World Masters, so I'm going up a category. Uh, the Masters, by the way, um, the veterans starts at 35 in Europe, which is great because I've been a veteran for like five years over there now, which is which is good. Over in England and UK, it's generally speaking, it's 40. So 
I'll be going up to the 40s this year um, and being, becoming an, a vet in England and, and Britain, also um, going up a category in Europe. So I'll be competing at the World Masters mountain running event in Austria this year, which is uh, Hellfest, which is a, an uphill only course. That's in September, hopefully this year. So that's yep. on my radar. I'd like to do well at that because I was second in the V35s in Italy in 2019. So my aim really is to try and, and win an event masters uh, that's going to be shortly be. after the chamonix one then because that'd be the yes, end of, yeah it is so i'm going to use my holiday at work to kind of stay out in europe probably and, and yeah. travel in the camper van that's the plan anyway the rough plan and i'll go from you know, the the mcc to um the world masters hoping that there's enough time to recover in between um and and have a go at that so that's that's they're the big two really and then the english championships i've just entered this morning endale which the distance doesn't suit me. It's not a race I'm particularly looking forward to, to be honest, because it's a long, a classic, a long fell race. The Lakeland Classic is always a tough ask. You know, it, it, these races are quite brutal because of what, what distance is that then? The terrain. Well, um, do you know, off the top of my head, I think it's a tw about 25 mile. I, I've not even checked. You're that. definitely I'm stepping up here on the distances, aren't you? Yeah, well, I'm doing this one just to kind of take one for the team really um, <laughs> and actually the team now at Calder Valley who I run for were in such good health as a team and you know I probably won't make the men's team because we've got such quality coming through in terms of youth but also we've got the likes of Carl Gray um, you know Darren Kay, Matthew Roberts um, uh, Adam Osborne who were the vet, vet 40s who were and, and above that I mean Carl's a vet 50 now but they're so good on that kind of um, race, you know, the long, tough stuff, which I'm not, you know, known for, for doing well at, but I'm hoping I can use that as training as part of the MTT. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm under no illusions. I, I certainly won't be winning that race, but Ivo will be the key. Um, but um, I've got that to, to come up in June. That probably be my first race back, I would have thought. Yeah, plenty of time to train and have nightmares about it anyway. You know, that sounds, sounds like a good event for a year. Hopefully, with those being slightly later in the year, they get actually go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because there's always a worry and risk now that things might get set back. So, I'm, I, you know, nothing is set in stone, as I know. But yeah. at the moment, I'm I'm training just to stay fit. I'm not. I'm training with the MCC in mind, but it's far too early to start training specifically for that. I'm just kind of thinking about being an all-round runner at the moment. So I've started to work with a coach this year for the first time. I figured I'd take it seriously now, I'm nearly 40. So I'm being coached by Sarah McCormack, who is okay, world, yeah, yeah, Sarah. world yeah. mountain running champion. So, I mean, there's no one better in that respect. And we do a lot of the same races. So Sarah's been putting my training plans together and been stopping me from doing too much running and making me do um, enough. Sometimes I'll either do too much or not enough. So that balance of training is there now, I feel. Um, and I can just look at what I need to do every day. And it takes that kind of um, thought process out of me as to what I'm going to do today or tomorrow. Because I just use, usually just about running. And yeah. I've never really trained properly for anything, if I'm honest, unless I've really wanted to do well at a race. Yeah. I've kind of just, I'd say coach myself, but there's been no coaching involved. <laughs> it's very much been run to feel. So this will be the first time, actually, where I've got some real thought behind what I'm doing <laughs> yeah. and real structure and you know who better to do that than Sarah because she's somebody who I massively respect massively trust she's a friend as well as a you know a mentor and I'm hoping that with her guidance uh, and help and the help of Paul Tierney who, as well who she you know she's got the company missing link coaches with yeah. um, they're both going to help me hopefully achieve my aims of doing well in the MCT and perhaps yeah, well, they'll have a huge amount of experience of racing abroad anyway so exactly yeah so you know I'd say I put trust in them I'm hoping that I can do them proud you know because there's that added, added expectation that you know they're providing me with the training plans and I've got to deliver as well so that's yeah. giving me a little bit of uh, impetus to kind of train hard and do well um, because I don't want to let them down and you know I've got a lot of respect for them but that's good for me because it gives me another reason and purpose to get out the door when the weather's bad and yeah. it's a done. And the one thing I do here, man, I'm not going to lie, I love hill reps. I do hill reps every day of my life, but I hate speed work. And I've not done any speed work since 2016 when I was like running really well. That's God's honest truth. And I've started doing speed work again this year. 
Oh, and I realise why I hate it so much. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting better, don't get me wrong, but I'm never going to be a Mo Farah. Like, I, I'm not particularly quick on the plan. And it's something that I think I really need to develop. And it's very important to be able to be a, a good all-round runner. You need to be fast as well to perform well in the mountains because yeah. it's another kind of string to your bow, as it were. You know, there, there are times when you're going to call up on that pace. And it, naturally, it makes you a better runner. Um, if you can climb well, you can descend well, but also, you know, have the strength and have the speed as well combined. So that's the big thing for me this year is to improve a bit of everything, listen to what Sarah and Paul have got to tell me and yeah. um, put that into practice really. Yeah. So yeah. lots to look forward to. Yeah. yeah, that sounds really good. It's good. Excellent. Well, hi, right, thanks for thanks for coming along. I think we'll wrap it up there. Well, on another point, no, we are going to do some live streams in the next few weeks, aren't we? Uh, so yeah, we've get... got plenty to, yeah. plenty to talk about. You know, I, I'm not sure for anything to say, and I know you're not either. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure we've uh, we, we've got quite a few kind of you know running related topics that we'd like to discuss, haven't we? And uh, yeah, exactly. you know, I find this kind of thing interesting. I could listen to running all day. Anything, anything about running is well. Ho hopefully, somebody out there to... likes listening to us talk about running. Yeah, who, who wouldn't want to talk, you know listen to two middle-aged men talking about running and gear and uh, you know running-related topics? It's, it sounds like every every runner's dream, doesn't it? <laughs> so, if anyone out there has any specific topics they want us to cover, uh, feel free to leave comments below. So, we're going to go over certain things like running with poles, like your lucky banner in the background there. We're going to have yeah, absolutely. Simon. Simon, who works for Lecky, who lives out in Spain, he's going to be joining us as well. So, so the, there's tons of topics, isn't there? Running, it's, yeah, it's there's, endless. The yeah, there's, stuff lots, talk there's about. lots of stuff to cover. You know, you're talking about the, the polls and how advantageous and beneficial they are in, in races. Also, you know, we'll, we might talk about new technologies, carbon, for example, carbon plates and shoes, yep. that kind of thing, you know. Where, what direction is, is running going in GPS devices, you know, how much can we rely on these and, you know, the pros and cons, that kind of thing. So we, we've yeah. loads to discuss, haven't we? So yeah, we have. We look have. forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. great. But right, so well, thanks everyone for, for tuning in and hopefully you enjoyed the chat and hopefully you join us in the future for some live streams. So, yeah, please leave a like, leave a comment, don't forget to subscribe and thanks very much to Ben for giving us some really good insights into his, into his running. Thanks, Thanks for having me. me. Cheers. Cheers. Take care, mate. See ya.